Right, we want to focus on the topic of the day, which is developing leadership character. And of course, we want to train our focus on what is really ailing the country as far as leadership is concerned. Do you think also in Africa we do have leadership character? And what does also character mean when it comes, or you try to juxtapose it with leadership? When it comes to leadership, as I mentioned earlier, competencies determine what a person can do, commitment determines what they want to do, and character determines what they will do. Character is foundational for effective decision making. Clearly, mistakes are made because of a leader's shortcomings in his or her competencies. More often, the root cause of a failing or of, is a failing of character, I should say. For example, not recognizing or not willing to admit that you don't have the requisite competencies to succeed in leadership role is rooted in character. Not willing to listen to those who can do well because of the perception that it will undermine your leadership is a problem rooted in character. Also challenging decisions being made by others but which you feel are wrong requires character. Dealing with discriminatory behaviors by others requires character. Creating a culture of constructive dissent so that others may challenge your decisions without fear of consequences requires character. The question is not really why character matters, but why it does not get the attention and respect it warrants. For character to find the spotlight it deserves, leaders need to illuminate it. We can see some light shade in organizational statements of values and leadership competencies, but the practice is not widespread. We believe organizations should move beyond statements of organizational values to, un or to anchor leadership development in profiles that define what makes leader or a leader good in addition to defining what good leaders do and how they can lead better. Right, but let's just hack back to see what happened previously on the Leadership Forum. And today's topic is uh, leadership character, developing leadership character. And we have Mike Heldon on the lectern ready to give us a sentiment on the leadership character and how we can develop a leadership character. He is a founder of the Dan Eldon Place of Tomorrow, the depot. Also, he's a managing consultant, a columnist with the Business Daily. Also, he, he says that uh, he was brought up in London, uh, yeah, but he has been happily settled in Nairobi since 1977. And in 1994 is when he actually founded the depot, a uh, living memorial to his late son, Dan, which started as an outdoor experiential learning center for young people focused on team building, and leadership 10 years ago uh, when he faced out the IT industry that had occupied his life until then he developed the depot into a fully fledged management consulting firm although he continues revealing potential of young people and he's up on the podium to talk to us about developing leadership character Mike you have five you have six minutes actually beginning now I have my red card just to remind you and my yellow card so midway I'm gonna lift my Yellow card to just tell you you're midway. Red card to just warn you also, you should be winding up. Overboard, I'll ring the bell. If you don't come out of that particular lectern, then I'll come and actually yank you out from that particular lectern as well. But you have six minutes beginning now. Thanks. Thank you, Duval. Good morning and good morning, everyone. As I was reflecting on what it takes to have the positive character of leadership, I kept finding examples of people holding back, holding back from doing the wrong thing in order to be left with doing the right thing. We're all full of temptations to take shortcuts, particularly if there's no reason why not to because of impunity. But some of us do hold back. Even driving here this morning at this unearthly hour that Dabal gets us up at, with minimal traffic. There are still people trying to push in only at higher speed. They're not holding back. They're showing bad character. To hold on to the football analogy, earlier this week, Colombia played England. And um, it was interesting to see that too many of the Colombian players found it too hard to hold back. And so they fouled Gareth Bale, the British striker, in very delicate positions and ended up having a penalty against them and eventually losing the game. This morning as I was driving here, trying to avoid the high-speed uh, um, Indianapolis uh, race, 
Um, I heard that Scott Pruitt, the very controversial head of the environmental uh, agency in America, has finally resigned, having been forced to accept that he had failed to hold back from conflict of interest and from lavish spending. On the positive side, yesterday at KCA University, we were being grilled by the Commission for University Education for their five yearly audit. And um, I was able to tell them very proudly about how our faculty there did find the strength to hold back. So instead of going on strike and complaining because their salary was late a few days, uh, now from time to time, they said, no, let's make sacrifices, let's hold together, let's keep delivering for our students in support of the longer term good. And I think there's a lot about this holding back thing to balance between instant gratification and the benefits, the longer term consequences of gratification deferral. Another example is when I came here in 1977, uh, I came to run a subsidiary, the Kenya subsidiary, of a British computer multinational. My bosses, my Mzungu bosses, uh, wanted me to be the big man, giving instructions and having people fear me. That was the normal leadership model and in too many situations still uh, is. I decided to hold back. I wasn't even tempted, actually, because that, I wasn't brought up that way. I, in England, uh, we'd lost that. But I had to find great strength to hold back and defy my bosses by trusting people, delegating to them, and empowering them. At the national level, did Uru and Raila hold back by having the handshake? not giving in to what so many of the supporters would have continued to wish cheering them on for, as though it were a football match with only winners and losers. But of course, elections are only for winners and losers normally. And so then the question is, how do you hold back from the way in which you seek to win? Do you seek to win by urging your ethnic community on against the other? Do you uh, find the strength to hold back from renting votes by being generous, which is what so many of our citizens still want? And as a voter, do we hold back from simply supporting the ethnic king or the one who is most generous with his handouts? There are many more examples here and internationally. Um, you've got the Trump win-lose school of life, You've got more the Macron um, um, and, and others, Obama, who try to bring people together around a common vision uh, and to live common values. And the first one is much easier. It works for Trump. He just appeals to his base. He winds them up um, with uh, statements that reflect always bad character. So what do we do about it? We've got the good guys holding back. Can they win? Got the bad guys uninhibited. They could have good character, but they'd be less wealthy. They'd have less power. So why not? Well, we have plenty of subcultures here that are very healthy. People who've developed among themselves a way of holding back mutually in order to gain collectively. There are societies um, around the world Maybe Rwanda is one example, Scandinavia, we know which the examples are, where people hold back from doing what they might be able to do because they appreciate that if I don't uh, keep pushing in the traffic, the traffic will flow more smoothly for everyone in the longer term. In a, our consultancy firm, we do a lot of work on this type of culture strengthening with such subcultures. I only wish it were given more attention at the national level. We have our national values, we have our chapter six, who looks at that? And partly because it is weakly expressed in dull terms, tucked away in the middle somewhere. But 
if you stimulate conversations around living up to a great vision, shared prosperity vision 2030, that sort of vision, and you appreciate, which is indisputable, that unless you live healthy values, i.e. be of good character, it isn't going to happen, then there is a better chance. Plus, incentives and rewards for people of good character and penalties for those of bad character. We are seeing people now in this renewed war on corruption or on political leaders, as the newspaper headline in the nation says, um, removing hopefully some impunity so that people who hitherto have not needed to hold back now will. In conclusion, and before the bell rings, I want to go back to what Gituro said. Actually, he was echoed. <laughs> one, one was echoing the other. Anyway, here's Henry Ford, who's, who quoted Gituro saying, quality means doing it right when no one is looking. So holding back even in the quiet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mike Aldon. And uh, we, of course, uh, want to thank you. He is asking a probing question. But, uh, are you actually uh, developing leadership character by urging your community on community or winning uh, or urging your community to win against uh, each other? You know, just profiling that ethnic uh, card. I think that is what he was really talking about and a raft of issues that he's really raised there, but that was one of the overarching uh, issues as well when it comes to, to character and winning. Do we win by any means, even if it means now driving a wage between communities? Up next, we have Professor Dr. Wainaina Gituro, and uh, he will be on the podium up next. Uh, you have your microphone on, so I'll still urge you to just remove it and then put it at the back of... Uh, of the seat, there is another microphone at the lectern, yes, as we walk over. He is a PH holder in agriculture economics, master in business uh, administration, administration and bachelor of education. He has extensive working experience with such organizations as World Bank, where he was a senior educational economist and where also he was the deputy managing director and the business development manager. And in, addi in addition, he has been a director of the social and political pillars under the vision 2030 is up on the podium right now to talk to us about what he thinks is a good character and how do we develop yeah, good characters and leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, we appreciate being invited here. Uh, today is interesting, we're almost like in the lecture room. So Dr. Tari here and I, we are used to this podium so I think the red card will come. <laughs> 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 but uh, I think it's early morning, uh, probably. I will not get much into that. But, but let me s start where uh, Mike stopped. And uh, uh, he mentioned about England, Colombia. I uh, was that much you right. Uh, but there's another part of it, Mike. Uh, if you watch the match between Japan and the same team, Colombia. After that match, it was interesting that uh, Japan lost. But what they did after that brings the whole character of leadership. They actually cleaned the whole stadium. And I think to me that's something I borrowed. Uh, how not even, nobody told them, but they were very clear that we need to leave this place, uh, place clean. What, what brings to my mind, it's one, the hard working. Secondly, and no wonder, if you step out here, the car perhaps behind you, in front of you, be a Toyota made by people who are hardworking. Uh, the same talking, uh, the same, the same uh, breath uh, where Mike was talking with the gentleman in, in, in the US. I think you should also have listened to uh, somebody who was hanged yesterday in Japan uh, for the chemical he used at a, at a, at a station. Uh, and it was interesting that the commentator was saying, if you go to China, you go to the station, you go through this metal detector. But if you go to Japan, they don't have it. Who is the metal detector in Japan? The people themselves. And, and, the, and that, to me, brings the issue of uh, having the, uh, the, the, the character we are talking about. Perhaps if I step back and Dr. Tari 
here has the same kind of experience is the experience at the university. What experience have I had at the university? And I've been teaching there since 1982. I've seen people come, but of late I've seen a different kind of character. And you ask them, if you're out there, would you go for what is happening? They say, yeah, sure. Why would I not do it? Everybody's doing it. And the most popular cost today as we talk is actually procurement. Uh, last, it was interesting, last financial, fac uh, sorry, calendar year, there were only six students who actually applied to do agriculture. But there were so many they could not do procurement. And it always goes to the character we have. I'll try to concentrate more, perhaps, what do you need to do? I think we know it. Uh, and when it comes to that, it's one thing. I think we come very, very hard in terms of certain. And, and I think, with all due respect, when you look at Chapter 6, very clear in terms of integrity, let's look at it. Everybody who is in the public office goes through that. But what they do is very different. The actions are extremely different in terms of what is in Chapter 6. And, and I think it's important at this stage as we get the, the, the headline there in the nation, the first page, that we want to do life, uh, life, 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 uh, lifestyle audit. And when it goes, and Catherine, you're here, and he worked with you very closely in terms of the code, it also touches the corporate world. And it doesn't make any sense saying that it's only public service which is subjected to that. Every Kenyan, should be subjected to that. Look at the headline you have today, Politics Are Shield Defender, which tells you perhaps there are certain characteristics we need to. And one of the things, and, 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 and I think uh, uh, Mike alluded to, I, I'll probably not give the example he gave, is a gentleman who just retired in Botswana. That gentleman retired even before his term was over. That gentleman is a gentleman who would say, he go to the rural areas with his people, you can go back to Gaboron. I'll stay with them one inch. That's a gentleman who made sure that the diamonds are traded in Gaboron. That's a gentleman. If you mention about diamonds there, you are dead. And you can see, go to Gaboron, you can see what that means, that country moves forward. That's what we are looking for. We are looking for somebody who takes responsibility. We have given you that position. <laughs> You must take, have responsibility. And the Mwanaichi are looking for you. We are looking for you to provide that leadership. Leadership to do the right thing. And I think the citizen, we as a citizen of this country, need to put them to account. I think that's the thing we need to do. Having it in the law is important. Unless we have a Michuki, then that law can be implementable. But we need as a citizen to take uh, into consideration. So I think it's important to hold back, but I think we need to go further than that. We need really to have a nation of non-nonsense. A non-nonsense if Catherine, uh, Calisto, or my uh, good friend Jenga, or uh, Mike there, you put you in. As we talk today, the gentleman of Malaysia is in. As we talk today, the Prime Minister of South Korea is in. And the last word I want to say, Let's take responsibility. You don't have to be told. Take responsibility. There are certain people in this country, as we stand here, should have actually have stepped down as we talk. Take responsibility. Thank you very much. All right. Take responsibility. Thank you, Dr. Gituro. Welcome back. You're watching the Leadership Forum here on the AM Live. And of course, we are discussing leadership character. Uh, we have Reverend Callisto. Odere, who is actually on the lectern right now. He graduated from Kenyatta University, Trinity International University, and Bethany International University, Singapore. Also, he worked with a fellowship of Christian Union Focus with students in uni universities and colleges for 13 years. This included pioneering and directing the commission conference, which is currently a major students' mission conference in Africa. He then served with International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, IFES covering the Eastern and Horn of Africa in English and Portuguese speaking Africa 
Reverend Odede has served as senior pastor at Sitem Woodley, Sitem Karen, Sitem Valley Road, and is currently a senior pastor of Nairobi Baptist Church. So you got five minutes, uh, six minutes actually, beginning now. Thank you very much, Dival. Uh, earlier on, I mentioned that uh, I would define character as a, a habit long continued. And that kind of a habit, uh, if it's continued for a period of time, becomes my identity. And uh, it can be positive or negative. When it is positive, we refer to it as integrity, a character that shows good qualities. And so we speak of a person of integrity because they are showing good qualities in terms of their character. However, when we come to the continent of Africa, there are all kinds of uh, narratives that have been projected about this conti uh, continent, some of them positive, some of them quite negative. Some have even thought that perhaps it is uh, uh, the media that is uh, portraying uh, Africa uh, in bad light uh, with the kind of images that are uh, perpetuated about the continent. I once listened to a professor of physics uh, in Ghana give a description of uh, what uh, the continent of Africa is like. I think uh, it's worth reading. He said, Africa is slipping from the third world to its own category, the nth world. He said, the shape of Africa is a gloomy question mark, a part of the world where children have swollen bellies and sad eyes, where soldiers blast away at each other in endless wars for incomprehensible reasons. Africa today marches towards a total catastrophe. The only reason Africa is still standing is because it does not know which direction to fall. Africa is like a star which has abandoned the law of gravity of its original constellation and has become a wandering star which will remain so unless she can again find an autonomous direction in its trajectory. When the good professor finished his presentation, I raised up my hands and I said, sir, do we live in the same continent? And I think the reason why I raised up that because although there may be all these negative narratives about the continent, yet I'm aware of some very positive things that are happening in the continent of Africa. So what then is actually the problem of Africa? Many gurus have pointed out their fingers to the, po uh, to the fact that Africa suffered, suffers from issue of leadership. It is not that the continent does not have leadership, but the kind of leaders that we have had, had in, uh, that we have had in the continent have left a lot to be desired. It is this that actually we point to when we say if we are developing integrity in leadership, good qualities, uh, then we do need servant leaders. What are the trademarks of these kinds of servant leaders? Unlike what we have talked about before, Nelson Mandela uh, gave fresh breath to this when he spoke in 1962. He declared, I was made by the law a criminal, not because of what I had done, but because of what I stood for, because of what I thought, because of my conscience. We are talking of leaders who have something that they can stand for something of integrity, something that they are so convinced this is the right way to go, this is the right thing to hold on to, that they are actually willing to sacrifice. And I'm very encouraged as a pastor when uh, uh, occasionally I have a member uh, of the church come to me and say, Pastor, because of what I stand for, uh, I am actually being threatened, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being fired, or because of what I, I, I refuse to sign this, uh, uh, someone is uh, uh, threatening me. Now, that is character, when you have something that you can stand for, certain values that you don't compromise, certain values that you look at and you say, this one here, even if you take me to jail, even if you kill me, because I'm convinced this is the right kind of thing, I will stand for it. And I think that's what we do need in all sectors of the community, whether we are talking of the church, whether we are talking of the media, whether we are talking of the politics, whether we are talking of uh, 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 civil service, uh, or even in the business arena, individuals who have certain values uh, that they actually stand for and they would not want to compromise those values uh, in any way at all. But it's not just something that we stand for. It's also 
looking at people with a different kind of set of glasses and looking at the people that we serve uh, with the glasses that we need to emulate and express some kind of love. A person who does not have love cannot be a servant leader. If you do not love the people you are uh, 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 serving, you'll actually steal even the medicine for the sick and go and uh, uh, sell it out because uh, uh, you, you don't care about those people. But if you cared about them, you will actually define your parameters and say, uh, my people are suffering and the money that I have is meant for medicine, is meant for the road. Therefore, I do not need to take it at, uh, uh, out. But because of this lack of love, we see people uh, engaging uh, in areas where they're actually looting uh, the nation and the country because they lack that kind of quality and character. A third thing that I, I would want to mention is not only love, but a, a character uh, that also exhibits a, a kind of a humility, a humility that acknowledges uh, that uh, uh, I have my limitations and uh, does not augur well with pride and arrogance and uh, chest thumping and winning at all costs. Because it is that attitude of winning at all costs that sometimes leads us uh, to a point where we begin seeing uh, the country uh, becoming violent, the country being di uh, divided into communities uh, because of these people who cannot step down at all. They, they have their position and they are holding to that regardless of what anyone else would say. They can't step down. Developing character therefore requires uh, that we be a people who are showing qualities of humility and who are uh, 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 exemplifying a, a character of servant leadership uh, among the people that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Kalisto Odere, for that passionate, of course, uh, uh, sentiments on developing character. And a developing character uh, requires, of course, uh, the quality of leadership and exemplifying also a servant leadership uh, as well. What do you really stand for? That's a probing question. Because if you stand for nothing, you will fall for anything. And a person who does not have love cannot be a servant leader, uh, says Reverend Galisto Dede. Up next, we will have Catherine Musakali on the podium to take us through, of course, what her thoughts are on servant or uh, developing character as a leader. She is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and a fellow of the Institute of Certified Public Secretaries of Kenya. Also, she's a founder of Dorian Associates, a firm specializing in governance matters and commercial legal consultancies. Uh, Catherine has extensive knowledge of Kenya's corporate government uh, governance framework. She has led the development of Mongozo, the Code of Corporate Governance for State Corporations in Kenya, the Capital Markets uh, Code for, of Corporate Governance Practices, for issuers of securities in Kenya, also the ICPSK Code of Corporate Governance for Private Companies, and also the Code of Corporate Governance for Public Benefits Organizations in, of course, uh, that is in Kenya as well. Uh, she is uh, a corporate governance trainer, a governance auditor, and a board evaluator, and has developed numerous governance policies for a number of institutions and she's an advisor also to many boards. I cannot mention them all here. And she's up on the podium also to mention she's the chair of the Women's Own Board. And she's straining at the leash to give us also her sentiment yeah. on what uh, developing leadership or character in leadership is all about. Thank you. You have five minutes. Thank you very much. How come you're giving me five minutes and oh, you gave six, them uh, six hey, minutes? Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> um, it is John Maxwell who said, um, a leader knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. I think for me that really summarizes what leadership is all about and what sort of character leaders need to have. Now just to build on what uh, the bishop has talked about, I want to speak a little bit about uh, the traits of, of, of a good leader. And I think the key one that has already been mentioned is one of integrity. You cannot be a leader, a good leader, without integrity. You cannot be a good leader without honesty. A leader is somebody who says, I made a mistake. I'm sorry I made a mistake and this is what I'm going to do to correct it. A leader is someone 
who is willing always at all times to go against the grain, particularly if going against the grain means doing the right thing. A leader is one who is willing to sacrifice for the greater good. And just going back to the example of Nelson Mandela, we may not agree with what he did with regard to Winnie, but he was sacrificing for the others. So a leader is one who sacrifices for others. A leader has to have confidence. A leader inspires others to the greater vision. You are able to um, uh, draw the big picture for the people who are following you, and you inspire them to walk towards the big picture. And of course, you cannot do that if you're not committed and you don't have passion for that, uh, for those whom you are leading and um, for whatever it is that you are leading them towards. You have to, to be able to make decisions because if you are a good leader and you're not able to make decisions, then you are actually leading people to nowhere because people look up to you to help them make decisions. You have to be courageous and accountable. Many times as leaders we are called upon to do things that are scary in themselves. But we have to do it because we are trying to set a good example to other people. We have to empower the people we lead. We have to empower them to be able to make decisions. We have to empower them to be able to, uh, to be courageous to take certain steps. But at the same time, we have to have empathy to wear the shoes of the people that we are leading. I think for me, great leaders have great emotional intelligence. Knowing, understanding themselves, knowing who they are, the values they stand for, what makes them tick, and also being able to understand the other people that they are leading. But leaders have to know when it is time to move on. You cannot be a good leader if you're hanging on all the time, forever, until God goes, calls you home. A leader knows when it is time to move on and to let others take the mantle. And for you to be a good leader, therefore, it starts with understanding who you are. What is your character? What makes you tick? What is valuable to you? What is the greater good in society? I think, again, most importantly, you have to be ethical. And ethics or ethical leadership sometimes comes at individual cost. You have to practice what you say. Because if I'm a good leader and I am just busy telling people to do the right thing, but in my own private life I am doing the wrong thing, then I'm not a good leader. I have to be able to practice and be seen to practice what I preach. I have to inspire greatness in the people that I lead. A leader is someone who is willing to m let the people they lead be greater than they are, inspire greatness, developing diamonds out of people who seemingly are useless. That's a great leader. So it is that person who inspires greatness around them, who has an aura of greatness around them, even when they seem so simple. A good example is our Pope. He is so simple, but being around him, there is that aura of greatness, yet great simplicity around him. Leaders should be able to break down uh, complex visions for the people who follow them so that you uh, gradually lead the troops to where you want to be. But you've got to be able to motivate, do the right thing and motivate people to do the right thing. Be transparent. Own up, speak about those things that are important to you, that are important to society. Coach, show the way. That is what leadership is all about. Above all, a leader is someone who is accountable to themselves first and foremost. 
It is not about other people holding you accountable, but you holding yourself accountable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine Musakali there. A leader is one who sacrifices for others, inspires confidence. Great leaders have great emotional intelligence. Of course, you have to know when it is time for you to move on. You don't just uh, hang by the fingernails onto power until you're actually using the aid of a worker as a leader. Mm -hmm. Right, we have Dr. Jenga, George Jenga, who's up next on the podium. Of course, he's going to close uh, that particular uh, segment of hearing from our speakers this morning. He's a current and founding executive dean of the Strathmore Business School. He's also a senior lecturer at Strathmore University in Ethics and Leadership. He has a PhD, honors for that matter, in political philosophy from the University of Navarra, Spain. He has masters in governance and culture of institutions from the same university. Dr. Njenga has also a master's in business administration and is a certified public accountant of Kenya. He is a founding board member of the Association of African Business Schools and an international advisory board member of Global Business Schools Network. He is a member of the board of directors of Passes Insurance Company. And of course, also the list goes on and on. I cannot also I just read all of it as well. But he's up on the podium right now. Dr. Njenga, you have six minutes. Thank you, Debal, and I honor all those speakers before me. I have thought largely uh, about character from the side of formation. And um, normally, uh, uh, when you think of the chicken and egg, of whether a leader is formed or born, <laughs> my tendency is to think that um, there are very few people with leadership character a character is seen in Jesus Christ, for instance. But let me give you what I think is the true leadership character. It has been said that character is a stable, habitual state, and that state is either of virtue or vice. That means that um, you can be a good person, positive, or a bad person, negative. In other words, Hitler, would be a person who is in leadership for the bad things or the wrong things, hopefully if history gives us the right facts. But leadership character that is good should be portrayed in such um, habitual abilities to be visionary, to see far. To look, for instance, like a mother looks at her little baby and sees him when he is mature at 25. A leader has to have a character that is loving, that is selflessness on behalf of the people, on behalf of the family, on behalf of the community. The leader must have extraordinary courage to overcome the fear of developing new areas for the good of the people and himself. And finally, must be selfless. All these are ideas that have been portrayed by our dearest colleagues before me, Catherine included, eh, in her portrayal of governance. Eh. But here comes the crux of the matter. So I'll give you about four points here. The first thing is that character is built mainly in the family. Uh, there is no major place as important in the building of a leadership character as in the father and mother cultivating the virtues of great leadership. And that is why we always worry that it seems as if those who lead, their children lead after them. Because obviously they have taught their children what leadership is, and the children have been drinking from the leadership qualities, whether good or bad. But if a father and mother cultivate slaves, then we have a problem. Uh, lazy, lying children. And when they take elections, uh, they take positions through elections, then uh, we should not worry that they portray those characters or characteristics in public office. 
therefore, we cannot underplay the important role of the family. Mm. I'm often intrigued by the fact that the greatest sportsmen, uh, not in our country though, but the greatest sportsmen in Europe, when you study their lifestyle, like Rafa Nadal or like uh, those tennis players from the United States of America or like Tiger Woods, you find that the formation of the character that is a winner globally is from five years old. And there is sincere dedication in time and effort and skill in building that leading ca character. So are our community of national leaders or families actually giving us the proper leadership training? I don't know, the proper leadership character. I have a problem with that. Eh? And this is because uh, our leaders don't punish bad character or they don't seem to punish bad character and really honor good character. Our heroes, especially those who represent the country in sports, are really seen as great men and women. In fact, they are seen as something small. Whereas dishonesty, greed, cunning, arrogance, uh, and the number of cars I drive on the road and the number of policemen around me to guard my dishonesty, that seems a great thing. Now, why is this the case? Um, I don't know why that is the case because when I go around my country, I find great men and women, sincerely great leaders from the point of view of character formation, but dead. Probably it's in our chapter six of the Constitution. What does that tell us? It talks about the character of leadership in public office and states things like respect for the common good, bringing honor and dignity to the office, having integrity. They say of that leader who is to be um, appointed to a public office on behalf of the people, that that person should uh, have personal integrity, competence, and suitability for the office. But now comes the crux of the matter. They also say that that person can also gain that office, not on the basis of those three things. Um, this I am assuming, because legally you can argue that. They say that, or they can be appointed in free and fair elections. As my colleagues before me, especially one of them whom I will not mention here said, we Africans have an affinity of going to free and fair elections and appointing people of no character. The mouthpiece and the ability to distribute cash freely to the people seems to be the basis of leadership character. And therefore the thugs have found a mainstay in appointing thugs as our governors and our leaders. Now, are there people of integrity in the current government? Sincerely, there are very, very many. But are there people of arrogance, rudeness, greed, stealing public? I don't need to explain that deeply to you. I think it is evident of itself. And it is sad that we sit here in the pulpit talking about leadership, but somehow we have never really understood how to help people in a democracy to elect good people. Could it be that the democratic system itself destroys the foundations of good character as leaders, good leadership characters? Could it be that democracy, because it's largely here in our country, not everywhere, here in our country, based on how much money you have, how much you can fund your party, how much you can fund the election, how much you can fund the houses, how much you can fund your cronies, or how much you can pay or mess around with the boss in order to get a higher position in an office. I don't know. But it seems the bad right now are winning in this country. And it's a sad state of affairs, whereas I know our country and our culture has always been meritorious in the character of building leaders. Why is it that when we go into democracy, we leave our cultures behind? Or do we? I don't know. Uh, Deval, these are the few ideas I have on leadership and characters and introduction. Thank right. you very much. All right. Was that it, or you saw the red card, then you decided, OK, the, yeah, this is where I should end. <laughs> I, I felt it. <laughs> you felt it? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Jenga. Right, let's just get down now to brass tacks and discuss these issues that you've raised. And uh, we can begin uh, even from that splash that we have on the Daily Nation today. And this is what you are alluding to, Dr. Gituro, as well. Uh, uh, because it seems uh, there is this misconception in the country that uh, our, our political leaders are our leaders. And so we cannot really uncouple, I don't know, leaders and politicians. It's a gray area for most Kenyans uh, to really get a limpid or clarity on that matter. So when we have headlines that, that, that we do have, like this one today, if my, my director CK may just pick up on that, Polix be our shield and defender. Do you think also uh, this is sort of an oxymoron, so to speak? Uh, it could be misleading to many Kenyans as well. But there is this also obsessive, you know, uh, there's this obsessive uh, notion that we have as Kenya about politics, that anything besides politics does not matter. Even on the political shows that we have here, people want to tune in for the political shows, not the, not the leadership forums. They want to hear what politicians will have to say. Uh, are we, as media, have also perpetrated in tr driving the notion about leadership and we portrayed politicians to be leaders and people who are in the corporate sector, they are not true leaders. So how do we uncouple this and bring it and bring clarity to bear? Let's begin with you, Mike. Well, you're right, uh, of course, and um, relative to most other countries, except these days perhaps America or Britain with Brexit, um, we have for long been a grotesquely over-politicized society. And you're right, even you admit it, the media loves it. Because unlike here where we have a, a respect for each other, we don't interrupt each other, we give each other space, uh, on the early the shows in the week, <laughs> They're always speaking over each other, and it's much more entertaining. And it's much more the daily episode of the soap opera. You, you build people up to say, oh, what's t tomorrow's episode? Mm -hmm. What will be the reaction to this <coughs> attack? And who's going to win and who's going to lose? Uh, and so everywhere, media loves uh, to cover politics more than some of us would perhaps wish particularly around election time, obviously. Um, and generally, the media loves writing more about the bad guys. And, and you look at just about every headline in every of these papers, that's the case. Um, I indeed, uh, I talk to more and more people who say, oh, I've given up watching news in the evening. I've given up reading newspapers, except maybe business daily mm -hmm. but it is entertaining they are more entertaining than we are at the same time along with that we give them excessive respect uh, they always have the front row in your church automatically they know they will of course they'll have the front pace uh, on the podium uh, and they will have these cars and it, there is this uh, ever since I've come here leaders generally get excess respect upwards and give insufficient respect downwards, with, with many exceptions. And this is what we have to help our electorate mm -hmm. with, our voters. We've had good civic education, but when it comes to going to the ballot box for that crucial decision, the good guy, the generous guy, the bringing together visionary, the ethnic warlord, I'll go for this one. I'll go for this one because I may benefit. It, it's almost a, uh, a ridiculous selfishness, unfulfillable. But that's how it is. And I don't know what's going to, uh, what it's going to take to enable the voter, us guys, to knowing who the good guys are, who will deliver shared prosperity and reduce poverty and bring universal health care, to hide the strength to vote for for such people. In Western countries now, whether in Central and Eastern Europe, in America, in Turkey, the populist is having the day. And um, it's this dramatic headliner without substance to back it up, without sustainability, that the voter is eagerly swallowing up against their own interest. 
Um, it, it must continue to be education. We keep talking about starting in the schools, the new curriculum framework, values-based education, in the churches, uh, in the communities, but we're not doing a good enough job at it, and I'm not sure the media also are. But we talk in the morning, I don't know how many people uh, listen to us. My plea always is that more of this sort of conversation should happen in the evenings, in prime time, uh, not when people are busy getting ready to take their kids to school or go to the office and to really focus and reflect more deeply in conversations around how to get from where we are to have more people join the Good Guys Club. Mm -hmm. All right, let, let's hear from Dr. Gituro. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, we turn our focus also on people who are making policies, people who are going to the office okay. and they want to catch the news in the morning, right? So we are not going for the 99 in the evening. We are like Jesus, uh, right? Uh, we are going for the one. <laughs> I want to make two, <laughs> Michael, point, yes. I want to make some two yes. points here, and, and I think I appreciate all the way from Dr. Jenga to Mike here. I think recent to ourselves, it's like talking to ourselves in the sense that we all know things. We know who is a good leader, we know that. And yeah. I think I want to concentrate by giving two examples. Uh, three, actually. One, and I, and I think I will use this forum, you get people in leadership, particularly the public in this country, is really a nightmare working with them. Even the one age, leave somebody like myself who was in government. And I think they need to humble themselves. I've been doing some initiative in Africa. You go to other countries, you see what it means for the leadership because this means a lot to the people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I want to give two examples. Constitution 2010, which we have on the table here. This constitution was likely to be voted no there was a high probability it would be voted no. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened, the then Mudaura Francis was the head of the civil service. He called us in the government and he told us, I'm giving you three months to go back to your rural areas. Talk with your parents. Talk with the villagers and tell them what the constitution is all about. And I can tell you when we went, I went to our, our, where I come from, it was very, very difficult to change because they had been told by certain institutions this constitution is not good. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting because they said, these are our children who we educated. Their telling is not good. Mm -hmm. I think the point Mike is raising, we need to go back and tell our people about leadership. Mm -hmm. Second, and I think that's very important, and I think Karisto, you have been there, you studied in Malaysia. The event which has happened for the last one month in Malaysia tells us how to address the issue of bad leadership. At mm -hmm. 103, they didn't even care whether you're 41, the current president of Ethiopia. He didn't care whether he's 41 years old. They brought somebody who is 103 because there was bad leadership. And within that time he has been there, 50 million dollars, billion has been brought back. As we talked yesterday, that guy's in court from Prime Minister. Very clear. And I think to me, those provide that. What do we need to do? And I don't want to go that. Leaders, I know that. I think one thing I have here, as a nation, we must find a way of punishing bad leadership. It's not through the law. It will not work. Not through the law? Not through the law. And I have total respect for the law. But you'll open a ponderous box for... But it's you, Kenyan. For the it's human we. rights activists. It's... I don't think so. It's you. Now, look at the Philippines. The human rights are making their noise, but that thing, the country has gone back to shape. It's no nonsense approach. We Kenyans must say no. We must hold them responsible. What do I mean? It's not even the, it's not even the ballot box, because you can be manipulated. But if my care is my paramedics is behaving, we'll work on you. But we, we pride ourselves as a, a law-abiding country. But how, yeah, how, yeah. How, how far has that law taken us? All right, Let, let's hear from uh, Reverend Callisto. How, how far has that law taken us? Uh, it's very interesting. And the last one I wanted to say, <laughs> sorry. As, as we leverage, and I think I, I commend the for the state. You are doing a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. But in the same measure, let's also portray good leadership. I think you are, you are doing a fantastic job. But also, and I think there's a point he's raising, do you have, and I, Dr. Tari, I probably don't agree very much with you. 
I think we have few good leaders and we have bad ones in this country, really. That's why we are in the level we are of poverty. All right. Uh, let's hear from uh, Reva. Unless Daktari wanted to clarify that. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, I hope this microphone is working. It is. Just uh, to clarify slightly, I said that it seems to me that today we have more bad leaders, we are doing badly, okay. than good leaders. Okay. But you know that is a kind of warmth inside. I'll leave it for later. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear from Kalisto. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's very interesting that uh, we should actually, uh, uh, Dr. Ari should be talking of a possibility of abandoning our laws mm -hmm. so do. that uh, perhaps we go the Philippine way of uh, uh, just I'm very about that, yes. target them and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and get rid of them, those who are bringing issues. Uh, but but I, I do think the issue with, with the law is not that we have bad laws. Uh, uh, I think the issue with the law is that the whole will to uh, see it uh, implemented. And uh, if we are thinking of uh, leaders and why we tend to uh, uh, look at politics as our a shield and defender. I think is the, the old African mentality of uh, 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 a hunter-gatherer kind of mentality. We see our leaders as uh, people who have gone hunting and uh, once they have slaughtered uh, uh, or uh, have been able to capture the animal, then the rest of the people come to uh, uh, get a piece of, of the animal. And as long as we maintain that hunter-gatherer mentality, if our leader is uh, being uh, 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 quote in quote, in our view, being uh, uh, victimized or being targeted, mm -hmm. uh, w there will be hue and cry from us because uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the, the man who, uh, the hunter, the real hunter, who is able to uh, bring in the resources home. And uh, unless and until we change that concept, which we've been trying, so that uh, a leadership is a uh, uh, kind of devoid of resources, that mm -hmm. resources are able to trickle down to the people, positions within government or institutions are not given on virtue of who is the leader, but because there are some laid down principles that are guiding that, people will still think of, uh, if I have uh, our man in, in, in the docket, uh, therefore uh, we will have opportunities. And because of that, uh, we totally overlook their uh, uh, bad <laughs> behaviors, uh, even if they are accused of stealing, we overlook that because we do know if he is our man, he will actually be able to bring us some uh, uh, resources when he gets into that position. And I think that's one of the key, the will to act, uh, the, the will and determination just to say enough is enough. Mm -hmm. uh, someone has got to stand up and say uh, this is contrary to the, uh, uh, the action of the people. <coughs> Not too long ago, uh, I spoke with a, a leader from South Africa, uh, uh, Reverend Frank Chikane. Yes. Uh, Reverend Frank Chikane is actually served under Nelson Mandela as the, uh, the Mudaura of South Africa. Mm -hmm. He served under uh, Tambo Mbeki. He served also uh, Zuma and left uh, uh, just at the end of Zuma's, uh, close to Zuma's leadership. And Reverend Chikane uh, points out that uh, at some point, they decided that they were going to create a forum where people can come and vent. Uh, if you know things that are happening uh, mm -hmm. within your offices, uh, a safe forum where you will not be victimized. You just come and vent and say, uh, I, I know this is happening. And it is that forum that then would pick up these issues mm -hmm. and begin raising them up publicly. Because individuals fear, if I bring this out, uh, I will be victimized. Mm -hmm. I may even end up dead. And I think these are some of the things that we need to create, forums that can make it easy for people yes. to point out where there is corruption, where there is nepotism, and where things are not going on right. Uh, uh, and that would safeguard our leadership uh, uh, as we move forward. Mm, thank you. Yeah. All right, let, let's hear from Catherine. You say that uh, leaders should inspire confidence. And looking at uh, the coterie of leaders that we do have in this country, uh, be it uh, from the public sector or even from the corporate uh, for that matter, do you think in any way they inspire confidence? Well, uh, there are some who do. So we should not just use a broad don't. brush to, you know? No, no, yeah, no. We, I, I, I don't think it's fair to use a broad brush. Um, uh, but I think for me, just picking up from uh, what uh, uh, Reverend is saying, 
is that we need to find a way of empowering our people, the Kenyan people, mm -hmm. to hold leaders accountable. Mm -hmm. The values, the national values that we have in our constitution need to move from the paper they are written on to our hearts and to our minds. We must be able to leave those national values and demand that our leaders leave those national values. And if we do that, then it will be very easy for our leaders to inspire confidence mm -hmm. in us. I think the problem that we have as Kenyans is worshiping bad leadership. We do worship bad leadership. That's why um, we cry and shout mm -hmm. when our leaders are held accountable and we see them as our people being persecuted. Yes. All of a sudden, leadership becomes a communal thing as opposed to a leader being um, somebody leading us, it is like we were all leading ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we must stop worshiping uh, bad leaders. We must uh, stop saying that our people are being prosecuted. And we must be the ones demanding that our leaders mm -hmm. do the right thing. I, I sort of uh, uh, agree with Prof that we can actually do this outside the law. We can but call them. Consistent with. <laughs> <laughs> I think what, what Daktari meant is we don't necessarily have to um, oh, take people to court. Yes. But assuming for one minute that the county in which I come from, mm -hmm. there is a bad leader, and our people are so empowered that we call this uh, a lady or gentleman to the community and we say, we are sorry, Correct. but we are calling you back. Correct. It is seemingly out of the law, but it is a legal means of doing it. Our elders used to do it. Exactly. Yeah. So can we start, and, and, and it starts with civic education, empowering our populations mm -hmm. to be able to hold leaders accountable and not just be able to do it, but to actually do it. Right. I uh, think that's the issue. Right. Catherine, as you are on that, and uh, we have callers who are hanging on the line, I just want to pick up also the business daily, and uh, you tell us on this as well. Are we placing much premium uh, to money than character? I know this is, uh, of course, the Nairobi listed, uh, uh, Nairobi Security Exchange listed companies as well. We have their faces there. And uh, this is in line with the corporate, co uh, corporate governance code that you came up with that, yes, we should have directors and board members also declaring, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what they do earn. Mm -hmm. But do we pr place much premium on the earnings and, the, you know, the trappings of power than of character? I'm not saying in any way these people, they are bad characters, right? So. Uh, I'm, I'm just asking us a very sincere question. Mm -hmm. Money, I think you character. There are some we look there. You can see some bad character in them, but <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. We won't mention names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Catherine. Um, you know that the, the, the remuneration reports that we have started to see. Yes have started opening up a, a, a discussion that we ought to have as a country. Um, the unfortunate thing is that when you see a number put there that mm -hmm. says jo uh, James Mathenge earned uh, 24.5 uh, million shillings, it doesn't tell me what exactly that 24.5 million was composed of. And for me to be able to interrogate that number, I need a lot of information. I need to have interrogated the annual report. Right. But having said that, um, money or pay for uh, top leaders must be commensurate with performance. Commensurate with performance. Yes. But we've seen uh, uh, Dr. Njenga, it's not really commensurate with performance. We have them really taking a wide, tiny sum of money home and the company is going down the tube. And even for that matter, they have bonuses. And of course, we know they've retrenched. And we can even talk about the salary, the salary disparities within this particular company. What sort of character do we have when you know that you go home with this uh, kind of money and uh, a janitorial pay, I should say, uh, for that matter, for, for someone who 
uh, who, of course, is putting so much effort also to work as well. But in between, the salary disparity is something which is a legal the worry. Disparity. Huh? Right. <laughs> the word is disparity. Disparity, <laughs> correct. <laughs> Dr. Njenga. <laughs> uh, yes, you are right. Um, there must be a medium, a balance in mm. what we earn, especially when we have certain capabilities and capacities to build assets. You know, you cannot deny a person who has worked so hard. Yeah. I, I know people like James Mathenge, uh, they are like my fathers. I know the sweat they have taken to build their assets. And they ought to earn from those assets. Yes. Nevertheless, I'm going to say this. There are very few people because of our education system and our skills development and our capacity to give opportunities to our ordinary mwanainchi that has built a very large population of poor people. Mm -hmm. Now, my people, listen. <coughs> Corruption is an economy. Corruption is an economy. Yes. It's a bandit economy. <laughs> it's a bandit economy trying to solve people's problems, and in the process, the tyranny takes most of that problem. Okay. Why? Because the good leaders, those who earn that amount of money and have created positively and generously that amount of money, really sit back to solve the problem of the people who are behind them. We are not benevolent. Why? Because somehow it's our money and I have a right to my money and I couldn't care less about the poor. Let the government take care of the poor. So corruption has come in and you see politicians taking money to churches. They fund a lot of churches and clean up the consciences of many people. And churches accept those money, uh, that kind of money. You cannot give a person who is not skilled a job in the government in a good system. You have to give it to the educated, capable, uh, experienced, checked. But corruption will give a job to a person who is mediocre. Mm -hmm. And those are the majority of people mm -hmm. from the point of view of capability. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a catch-22. We have a good system even in our minds here that never thinks of the poor person, mm -hmm. really speaking. Mm -hmm. That forgets the poor person. Eh? Corruption reaches out to that poor person. Why? Because that poor person is the majority voter. Mm -hmm. And so, for the poor person, why should I care about James Mathenge or uh, Catherine or Michael Joseph or whoever it is? If when they are doing so good, they forget us, whereas the bad man seems to be remembering us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. Good question. And we have a callers who are hanging on the line. I will uh, uh, just get to hear from them as well. And uh, up is uh, Simon, who is hanging on the line. Good morning, Simon. We have a contribution, a question for our panelists this morning. Yes, good morning, panel. Morning to you. We are taking this opportunity, Mr. Uh, to, uh, to, to congratulate the panelists. Yes. Uh, to be handled in this uh, very weighted topic. We are expecting the opportunity and uh, greet uh, Reverend uh, Kalisto mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I want to say one thing about Kenya. Kenyans adore pain. In fact, the Africans like pain. If you instill, instill pain in them, then you become their hero. If you don't instill pain, you are no longer anything else. And the problem in Kenya is this one, not corruption, yes. but last. Last. Shauku. Sama. Last. Last. You, you will find that last in the church, last in the mosque, last in the temple, last in the community, everywhere. In that, there is nothing else a Kenyan can uphold in terms of ethics. So, if you come politely and you talk development, good things, and you are not feeling pain in a Kenyan, mm -hmm. you have no vote and you have no place in them in the society. In that way, it has made God is not speaking to Kenya. God is silent, so we decide our own things. And that is how we are going. And then the, one of the panelists has said that what makes Kenya tick is yeah. corruption. So corruption is actually an industry. In itself, it's a whole business. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Right, thank you Simon. Thank you Simon from Bungoma and as always Waluya mbako watume salamu na salamia Reverend Kalisto. <laughs> All right, we do have as well uh, Richard who's hanging on the line. Right, Richard, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Yes, you have a question or a contribution? Okay, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, let, let's take the question, please. Question. All right. Oh, you know, you know, as far as leaders are concerned here, yes. Then we have you are responsibilities, eh? and the people need a leader who takes responsibility. And now, now, the point now. Uh, Richard, uh, just allow me to. We will call you back. Uh, because uh, your line is uh, a bit sporty, we can't hear you clearly. But we have Jackson, nonetheless, who's hanging on the line. Richard will get back to you. Jackson, good morning. Jackson, good morning. Jackson from Kilgoris, good morning. Okay, they always say monkeys are hanging on the line. And it seems today also they are hanging on our lines. <laughs> we'll get back to Jackson and we'll get back to Richard as well. But we have also uh, reactions on uh, social media, right? We have Angeline Wambua saying that, uh, very true, when you humble yourself, God will lift you up even on your leadership. Also, John Gidongo is saying that nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test his character, give him power. That is what Eb Lincoln said. Also, we have Kalista's uh, Murunga saying, that's true, Kenyan do exactly that. I don't know what he was alluding to, you, but uh, of course, we want to appreciate him as well. Nathaniel Arapchumo is saying, inculcating acceptable leadership ethic is urgent, as amassing wealth by leaders is an art perfected in Kenya. Also, we have uh, the auditor himself. Will the, same pastor receive, uh, will the same pastor receive gladly money from looters as tithe and offering? Right, I think this was uh, being uh, targeted uh, to uh, Reverend Callisto, and I think also you alluded to that, uh, Dr. Njenga, about even also uh, the church and the laity receiving uh, monies from some of the politicians, as we've seen in this country, uh, with, through Harambe. Sadly, impunity is overwhelming. Is this country, in this country, as it is closely linked to abuse of power of, by those in authority? Tell the truth. We have Jacob. Um, Talala saying, leadership is inborn, God-given gift. It has no age. It waits. Uh, it waits. From the Bible, we read of David, who was chosen by God um, through prophets from sheep fields, so to lead Israelites. In our modern human history, we force it, then wait it to come like joy. Well, I leave it for you to decipher what he says there. And uh, it goes on and on and on. So we'll get back to, of course, our, our callers, if we may, uh, get the line uh, clearly from, from there as well. But let's, let's just get back to that. Maybe, uh, Reverend Kaliso, you need to clarify that Thank because maybe you, we man. might get into so many of these discussions and we don't, we don't really fail or we don't really address this particular issue. Uh, it, with the altar and the sanctity of the mm -hmm. altar today, it seems also uh, it is not really being given yeah. uh, the purity, the respect that it has because Many politicians are given the pulpit to actually spew some of the ritual from the pulpit. It has become a politicking pulpit. It is not a place where I want to come and pray mm. and bear mm. out mm. You know, my heart to God. Mm. Harambees, can you bring clarity to bear on this with what is happening? Should we receive them? Maybe just to respond to what one of the uh, Twitterati yeah. was saying. Thank you very much. I, I think these are, these are pertinent questions. Uh, which uh, I have reflected on quite a bit. Uh, yes. You think of a church in the rural area where uh, perhaps a monthly income from the villagers and the people around would amount to something like uh, 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 200 or even 1,000 shillings uh, monthly income. And uh, they've been trying to raise some money to buy some benches uh, mm -hmm. in that church. Yes. And here comes a politician and he says, uh, I'm going to help you buy these benches. I'll, I'll buy all the benches. You don't have to work for five years. Now, it's very difficult for that church in the rural area to mm -hmm. say, no, we will not receive uh, uh, those benches. Mm -hmm. There are some churches, uh, the kind of church where I am in, mm -hmm. uh, actually we have uh, certain principles that we would go uh, along with. Yes. Uh, 
we would uh, receive offerings, but offerings are given anonymously. Uh, we do not know which money has come from salary, which money has come from, and we just have offering bags and people give anonymously. And that's the way we would do it. Now, if someone deliberately brought us money and said, we know this is from so-and-so, mm -hmm. and we know the, uh, the character, then we are, are obligated to actually respond and make a stand against that. And, and just to also mention that uh, uh, when it comes to uh, politicians using the platform, uh, again, the same thing uh, uh, would happen. Uh, churches like the one where uh, I attend, mm -hmm. uh, a number of politicians and senior people would come on Sunday and they would sit in the pews just like everyone else. Yes. They would leave the church. They would not be given a chance to say anything at all. But there are some churches where that cannot happen. But uh, the father will give some money. If they give, they would give anonymously with everyone else. Like offering. We pass the bag around uh, rather than giving uh, specifically at, uh, in terms of a donation. Now, uh, the reason I'm mentioning that is uh, if we invited a politician for a function, mm -hmm. uh, we're inviting you for this function, then uh, uh, because we have invited him, he's a guest of the church, then it becomes very difficult to say, now you can't uh, uh, say anything. Mm -hmm. But those politicians that we will invite, we also would vet what kind of a politician would you actually give space uh, to say something, rather than just uh, uh, giving space to everyone. Because if you do, uh, the issue is if a politician is rejected because of their lifestyle and the church handled them so closely, the church similarly will be rejected at the same time because you have knit so closely with the politician, including national leaders. Uh, so the policy that we adopt, treat them with a long wooden spoon, mm -hmm. uh, which does not conduct. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, I, I, I thought that is clarity, and I think you also clarified very well. I want but but there's something you. I wanted to talk about Jenga. If you may, about, you. about Jenga? Yeah, what he said. Okay. <laughs> I, I think, I think Dr. Terry, I agree with you. <laughs> And, and it's something which I wrestle with every day. Uh, an opportunity to work out there in Garissa, Turkana. Do we actually know the status of those people there, the poor? I, I think you raised that important point. And right now, as I sit here, we're actually doing this all those, this whole week. We are costing the, what's the social cost to the household of malnutrition? It's an enormous figure. And we're doing this across Africa. Mm. And it's within the poor people because the intended taxation, the plain taxes, are not in that poor. And I think that's our biggest challenge. Right, thank you. Right, that's a post giver for you. I'll, I'll give you time to think as, uh, as I give it also to uh, Mike <laughs> Eldon. All right, Mike. Thanks, um, Dabal. I want to come back to these guys earning big bucks, and we saw the CEOs earning multiples of this. This is on the business daily? Yeah, yeah the, oh. the what top NSE company board members are paid. Uh, can, let's just have it. Yeah, direct. Um, and, yes, and, thank you. Yeah, um, Victor Juma loves focusing on this in business daily. It's become a regular of his now. Uh -huh. and, and we saw 30 million, 60 million. Um, um, as Catherine says, we don't know how they're broken down. but. I think the justification here is elsewhere, Yes, is that, well, these are the market rates. If we don't pay these rates, we won't get good people who can build assets and, and work uh, 36 hours a day. But uh, and the consequence of all of this is the increasing inequality. And then, the, and then the question is, what do all these people earning tens of millions of shillings a year do with that? And to the extent to which they do personal uh, resp social responsibility. Are they creating wealth, as Jenga was saying? Well, let's assume they are. And, and some are more than others. Some are making huge losses, still making huge money. But, um, and maybe it would have been much worse, those losses, had they not been the good guys minimizing the losses. So we still can't say because the losses were poor, they didn't add value. We have to look into the specifics. But the question is, to what extent are they contributing personally and corporately to the Sustainable Development Goals, to doing CSR in reducing inequality. None. And it's obviously to a greatly insufficient extent. Mm -hmm. um, the private sector now is beginning to buy into CSR being more than the occasional arm's length check. 
for a picture caption photo in the media. But it must go much further. In America it's terrible, in most countries it's terrible. You look at now the example set by the uh, Mexican president who was elected just come in, yeah. last weekend. Yeah. He's not moving to State House, just like your friend the Pope uh, isn't in the Vatican Palace. Right. And they're setting an example. Will anyone follow? Probably not. Probably not. And of course, our governors now, you've seen uh, the Senate has actually stopped, uh, you know, the, the proposed building for, for houses for the governors. Running into millions, you yeah. know, you want governors who no, are No, they're just to, reducing the cost, they're not they, eliminating. They, they're not but eliminating, <laughs> yeah. But, but, but yeah. they've been stopping you, for now to just investigate. just a small mansion. You had the anger of Simon. <laughs> All right. From Bugoma. Yeah. Simon was actually talking with anger. Simon. And I'm telling you, it will reach somewhere and it will break. But aren't you angry? I am. <laughs> Simon, <laughs> if you listen to Simon from, from uh, Bugoma. From Bugoma. He will reach a point and say, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Yeah. And, and here we have the Salaries and Remuneration Commission for public servants. Yeah. Okay. They reduce salaries for MPs. They say, no, 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 no. We want higher ones after all because we have to be so generous to have the people vote for us. Thank you. All right. Let, let's hear your closing uh, comments also from uh, Catherine briefly. Uh, yes, what is your sentiment? Then we'll begin the closing uh, statements also from uh, Dr. Jenga. I think I just want to pick up on uh, what uh, the Reverend said about uh, politicians and churches. Yes. Um, I think the last place that politicians should be rejected is the churches. Because that's where, as people say, uh, truth should be spoken to power. Mm -hmm. That's where the church should actually hold them accountable and say, yes, you have come, but there's this, this, and this which you're not doing uh, well, and it is setting a bad example. So I don't think that we should uh, sit back and say um, that uh, when they go to church, they should be rejected. No. That's where they should be held accountable. Yes. And, and, and politics is not really divorced from uh, Christianity or um, Islam or whatever. The two are intertwined because ultimately that's part, part, part of society. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think the problem we, uh, we have here in Kenya is that we are a very materialistic society. Mm -hmm. We and worship, exactly, yes, individualistic, materialistic. That's why that poor person there does not matter to me because they don't add value to my life. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to turn away from that and, and, and take a holistic view of society and what am I adding to society? Mm -hmm. How am I contributing to society? What do I owe society? Because we were put in this world Thank to you. contribute to it. Thank and you. therefore, we must uh, continuously do that. All right, uh, Dr. Njenga. So we have been talking about leadership character. My humble opinion is that it is directly opposed to corruption. In fact, the opposite of the leadership positive character that we have been expounding on here is directly opposed to the exercise of vice, which we call corruption. And that is basically summarized as taking away from what is common and for the good of the people and subsuming it in yourself, mm -hmm. if not in your little community. So we have two options. As the corrupt are acting outside the law, and they are against the law, and they are using the very law to Correct. sustain themselves in the act of corruption. Yes. Therefore, uh, Professor Geturo, I agree with you. <laughs> there is no doubt that if the president wants to act properly yes. in this particular case, he has to take a hand that respects the Constitution, mm -hmm. but uses that Constitution in a manner that the moral good of the people is far higher than the Constitution. 